Hi, welcome all. It's so great to see everyone here tonight. I'm Nikki Fabrican, and I'm an editorial board member of NACLA and a longtime supporter. Um, so NACLA is an independent non-for-profit organization founded in 1966, doing really important on the ground political economic uh, coverage of the region of Latin America. It's been used many of these articles by scholars, activists alike for uh, advocacy and fostering knowledge. Um, so tonight I, I ask first and foremost that you all subscribe. Everyone on this uh, Zoom call must subscribe to NACLA. Um, you can get copies of the print magazine, which is pretty amazing that you could still get print in the mail. So if you want to individually subscribe, please go to nakla.org and um, order individual subscriptions or info at nakla.org. Um, and please, you know, contribute. Think about donating. We do all of these events constantly and always in need of uh, resources, especially during this moment. So this is the first of our three-part 50th anniversary celebration. And we're really excited to celebrate NACLA and the incredible coverage, the relationships, the history, the anti-imperialist lens. Um, so stay tuned for the others. <laughs> we will have two more as we reflect on 50 years. Um, Tonight, we're going to be talking about eco-socialism. The second panel that we will do in the spring is going to be on race and racismo in the Americas. And then in the fall, we'll be thinking about the question of what solidarity looks like today. So I wanted to kind of introduce um, the panel tonight and introduce the moderators. And then Daniel and Thea will take it over to introduce this incredible group of panelists um, that they've brought together. So the title for tonight's discussion is Ecosocialismo, Envisioning Latin America's Green New Deal. Uh, this does come out of their beautiful, beautifully edited, a Green New Deal issue. So if you just want a copy of the issue, you could certainly get that. Um, we started this idea uh, just kind of brainstorming uh, before the global pandemic, but I think today it's particularly important to be thinking about these intersecting uh, economic, public health, ecological, and in environmental crises. And I guess as we're sitting at home, I want us to kind of envision and think about what a Green New Deal across borders could look like. I know that all of these people are going to bring their insights and their brilliance for allowing us to dream together tonight. So opening up our radical imagination and unleashing those freedom dreams is probably what Daniel and Thea do best for all of us. So I'm sure they'll facilitate a fabulous conversation. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce my two friends and comrades, Daniel and Thea, um, who truly represent for me the best of what the Academy is these days. Uh, they have one foot completely, or maybe their whole bodies in a world of organizing, and the other foot in the world of writing, thinking and analysis. And we should all be as committed in terms of left uh, politics and social organ social movement organizing as the two of them are. So Daniel Adana Cohen is an assistant professor of sociology at UPenn, where he is director of the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative, or C SC2. He works on uh, politics of climate change in the US and Latin America. And in 2018 to 2019, he was a member of the Institute for the Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. He's led research uh, for the Green New Deal around questions of public housing, um, and also um, constantly, I'm adding to, to the bio that he sent me, but always in negotiations at every single level, I feel, at a local, regional, and national level about how to push forward um, a Green New Deal. So he has written extensively for um, Jacobin, Nakla, The Guardian, you can find him in Descent and many other places, as has Thea. Um, and so I'm really excited to have him here tonight. And Thea Rio Franco is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College. She's an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and a Radcliffe Institute Fellow. And her research focuses on resource extraction, renewable energy, climate change, green technology, social movements, and the left in Latin America. Many of these themes are explored in her book, Resource Radicals, uh, from petro nationalism to post extractivism in, in Ecuador. And she co authored with Daniel and um, some other friends, 
great friends, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, um, Verso Books. So she has also written extensively for The Guardian, Boston Review, Dissent, Jacobin, uh, Nakla, and is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America and serves on the organization's Green New Deal uh, campaign committee. So I know that they will introduce uh, Julie Klinger, Sabrina Fernandez, and Ruth Santiago. But I'm just want to express my thanks to all of you for coming together to envision across borders what this Green New Deal could look like, and um, for us to just begin these kinds of intellectual and political conversations. Um, so just briefly, two upcoming events, and then I'm turning it over to Daniel and uh, Thea. March 11th at 6 p.m., NACLA has a reporting from Mexico, History Lessons for Journalists Today, where Don Paley will be leading a conversation alongside Lisbeth Hernandez and Vanessa Freje. And March 20th at 4 p.m., we have a discussion on Haiti, launching our new issue. So please follow NACLA.org, get on. Um, also, you can follow them on Twitter and other social media sites for some of our events. Daniel and Thea, it's all yours. Thanks so much. Um, I hope I can live up to that uh, amazing introduction. It's, it's truly an honor to be here. I'm super excited. Um, so across the Americas, we're facing the intersecting crises of COVID, climate, and a deeply unjust economy. In these contexts, the promise of ecosocialismo and of course the threat of eco-apartheid are more urgent than ever but the politics of attaining a green and socially just society are of course extremely fraught and complex. I discovered this firsthand doing research for the book that would become Resource Radicals, which traces the intense conflicts between two different visions of leftist transformation, anti-extractivism and a commodity dependent left populism in the context of Ecuador. These competing visions were front and center again recently with candidates representing each on the ballot box for Ecuador's still unfolding elections. And they recur everywhere that lefts, leftists and progressives have taken power from Bolivia to Argentina to Mexico. These different approaches to left political economy are also newly salient in the context of a pandemic and economic devastation. Across the region, movements and policymakers are thinking about how to recover from both without reproducing the inequalities and vulnerabilities that are all too painfully obvious. New visions have flourished from the Pacto Ecosocial to Nuestra America Verde and more that stitch together egalitarian and ecological demands and call for a regional economy centered on socio-natural care. These paradigms are of course in conversation with the push for a Green New Deal and a just transition in the United States. Around the hemisphere, we are grappling with a shared dilemma of rapid transformation to a low carbon post extractive economic model guided by the principles of democracy and social justice, an aspiration that inevitably crosses borders. So I couldn't imagine a more opportune moment for this panel. And I'd like to pass it to Daniel, who will say a bit more on these themes and also introduce our amazing panelists. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Thea. Um, thank you, everybody. I am so excited to be here. So I will be very brief so we can get to our brilliant panel. I'm gonna read a like four sentence excerpt from our introduction to the issue, introduce the panel and we will get to it. Um, one of the points that we make in our introduction to this NACLA special issue, and that I think is, is relevant right now is that the politics of the climate, politics of the environment aren't just the politics that go in terms of environmental ministers and when they say environment this or environment that. And it's not just about what environmentalists who've been working on this for years talk about in terms of the environment, many times heroic. But I think in our view, the green policy elites in particular have just been tinkering at the edge of the economy. Um, what matters is changing the entire economic system, the entire economic system. So this is really a battle between oligarchic capitalists and popular movements between incumbent interests of fossil capital and a wide array of pro-renewable energy forces, popular forces from the left. And this is in a context of crisis. So um, we're gonna hear from three brilliant speakers uh, in a minute. They're each gonna speak for about 15 um, minutes. After that, we're gonna have a Q and A, um, which Thea and I will moderate. If you wanna talk about what's going on, 
in this panel, get into the chat. If you want to make sure that your question uh, is posed by, by Thea or me to the panel, throw that into the Q&A function but, you know, at the bottom of the Zoom. So you've got your chat to chat, and you've got your Q&A for the Q&A questions. Uh, and Thea and I will go through those uh, um, after the presentations and pose those to the panelists. So um, in order, we're going to hear first from Ruth Santiago. She is an environmental and community lawyer who lives and works in Salinas, Puerto Rico. She is the recipient of the Sierra Club's 2018 Robert Bullard Environmental Justice Award. She serves on the Earth Justice Board of Trustees and co-authored um, Ustedes Tienen Que Limpiar Las Cenizas y Irse de Puerto Rico Para Siempre, La Lucha por la Justicia Ambiental, Climática y Energética, uh, como, trasfondo, como Trasfondo del Verano de Revolución Boricua 2019. Um, so Ruth will say it even better than, than me in, in a minute. Um, but we are so excited to have Ruth, like the other panelists, the author of a fantastic article in this issue, in this case, uh, Ruth, the co-author of a brilliant article on energy politics in, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, next, we'll hear from Sabrina Fernandes. She's an eco-socialist based in Brazil, although coming to us heroically from Vienna at an insane hour. It's like 17 in the morning or three in the morning. It's, it's a crazy hour, but Sabrina's heroically with us. Um, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies of the Rosa Luxemburg Siftung in the University of Brasilia, senior research fellow at the University of Vienna, uh, she runs the radical left YouTube channel, Tezi Onzi, which is fantastic. We'll post links. She was also the head, uh, the lead editor for the launch of Jacobin Brazil. She's a contributing editor at Jacobin Magazine. And I think she is the America's preeminent Green New Deal influencer. So follow her on social media um, if you don't. But she's doing an enormous service of pedagogy, communication, intellectual leadership. And she may talk about the role she played in a great call for social ecological transformation across uh, the Americas that came out recently from a number of movements and intellectuals in Brazil. And then we'll hear from Julie Michelle Klinger. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware, where she's the associate director of the Mineral Material, Materials and Society Program, has several academic and popular publications on rare earths and global resource geopolitics. Her recent book, Rare Earth Frontiers from Terrestrial Subsoils to Lunar Landscapes with Cornell has received the Meridian Award from the American Association of Geographers for its unusually important contribution to advancing the art and science of geography, unquote. That is the, the term from the award grantors. So an absolutely fantastic panel. I've learned from each of you panelists an enormous amount already, excited to learn even more tonight, um, and just really thrilled to talk about what climate politics can become. The Green New Deal is in the title of this event. Nobody here is saying that Latin America has to call for a Green New Deal. Latin Americans have to call for a Green New Deal. We are really interested in you know, radically democratic, climate and economic uh, and racial and class politics from below. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Ruth Santiago. Okay, hi everyone. I'm just gonna pull my slide up here. Uh, hello everyone, uh, really happy to be here and be part of this event. Um, as Danielle mentioned, I live and work in Puerto Rico and uh, especially with, I, I work with community and environmental groups here, uh, especially in southeastern Puerto Rico, where we have uh, all of the elements of environmental justice and justice going on with respect to the energy system. So um, in this first slide, this is one of the groups that I work with, but with others as well. And um, we're often not on the map, so I just put a little star in there so you can find us. Um, and, but we are definitely part of the, at least Caribbean and Latin American community, um, except that we have, as you probably all know, a, a different relationship with the U.S. in terms of um, territorial status um, as a non-incorporated territory of the United States. Um, so I'll jump right into the topic of um, our proposal uh, and our situation here with, with the energy sector. I think everyone is very much aware that uh, in 2017, we had um, two hurricanes, one of which um, basically took down the electric system in Puerto Rico. And um, we've been working for a, a very long time on energy issues here, but certainly um, the hurricane devastation brought the issue uh, very much to the top of uh, our priorities. And 
Um, so I guess you can call our civil society proposal for energy, radical energy uh, transformation, uh, part of what might be Puerto Rico's um, energy Green New Deal. And it's, as, as uh, is indicated in this slide, um, and I should mention that I um, had the collaboration of the co-authors on the article, um, Hilda Llorenz and um, Catalina de Onis. And so we have all these nice references in here to some of the points that I'll be making about our um, Energy Green New Deal, uh, which has a name and, and, and I'll explain a little bit later about, about that. So it's, it's, it's centered on the community empowerment through participation in the electric system as not mere passive consumers, but producers and consumers, right? And the way we uh, envision that is primarily through um, rooftop solar, on-site solar systems, coupled with battery energy storage systems. And um, we've learned a lot from the faculty at the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez, who for over a decade now have been promoting that solution in, in conjunction with a lot of other uh, measures that can be taken like energy efficiency and conservation and um, demand response programs. And, and just generally speaking, energy literacy, right? Because you saw that the title to the talk is energy democracy. So how do we start on our path towards energy democracy? Well, we, we have to have a great deal of energy literacy among our population. And after Hurricane Maria, we got um, some of that, right? And, and to the point where people here sometimes know the number of their transmission line, right? And so they know when it's down, they're not gonna have service. Um, so Hurricane Maria really just unveiled, right? Um, the multiple crises in Puerto Rico, um, the, the huge poverty rate um, and uh, the, the disaster of the transmission and distribution system, especially within the electric system. And so communities, we, we learned um, that we have to become energy literate and implement all of these programs that, that I mentioned earlier, energy efficiency, and participating as prosumers in the system. Um, and we now have an opportunity to actually put in place a large part or a substantial part of what we call this Energy Green New Deal um, with the funds that have been allocated by the Federal Emer Emergency Management um, Administration and um, to a lesser extent, uh, the Housing and Urban Development, um, Department of Housing and Urban Development that are finally supposedly be be going to become available to repair the electric system here. And what we're proposing as civil society groups is not the repair and, and rebuilding of the same system, but rather using that a huge amount of funding that is, is a historical number. It's uh, apparently third after um, Katrina funds and, and San Hurricane Sandy funds in terms of the amount that, that uh, FEMA and HUD would be making available. So we're um, looking for those funds to be earmarked um, so that local communities uh, in conjunction with our uh, public utility um, can create um, the solar communities um, and transform the electric system from what it is now. Um, and so we know for a fact uh, that this proposal is economically and technically viable. Um, and it's, it, we're basing this on, on documents um, that we've been studying and, and litigating over for uh, a few years, that it, one of which is the integrated resource plan for the Puerto Rico electric system prepared by Siemens Industries. They had to acknowledge that actually rooftop solar um, sited on the, on the rooftops of, of uh, customers, uh, existing uh, Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority customers um, would be the least cost alternative here. Uh, uh, cheaper than coal, gas, petro, um, all of the other alternatives. Um, and it's also, of course, um, 
based on studies both by the faculty at the University of Puerto Rico and the National Renewable Energy Labs that we indicate that we have four to five times the necessary rooftop resource and potential to generate energy citing these um, equipment, this uh, uh, photovoltaic panels and, and uh, other equipment right at the place of use. And, and so cutting out this huge transmission and distribution cost um, that would entail rebuilding the same system we had before as opposed to doing this. And as we mentioned, this is coupled with um, other measures that have been um, recommended. And so our civil society proposal is called Queremos Sol, We Want Sun. And so the groups that came together initially um, about uh, almost three years ago to work on this are uh, like the the prepa employee union the biggest prepa employee union UTIER, uh, the puerto rico chapter sierra club local environmental organizations diaspora and puerto rico based organizations um, environmental justice organizations professional organizations faculty members etc um, and so yeah i mean it, what we're proposing basically is that the public utility work with local communities to uh, totally and radically transform the way energy is produced and and distributed and transmitted and and that basically is done through uh, implementing this photovoltaic um, technology with batteries coupled with batteries um, and uh, empowering local communities um, and and achieving uh, environmental and social justice Oh, sorry. Okay, so currently, unfortunately, our system is a very centralized system. So lots of centralized transmission and distribution, very costly and very vulnerable to uh, being impacted by hurricanes. Again, many people are not aware that in the last 30 years, every hurricane that struck Puerto Rico took down the transmission and distribution system that runs primarily from Southern Puerto Rico to the North and is in the path of the hurricanes that come in through the east and exit through the west. And so we have this very centralized transmission distribution system, very problematic, and that's what was mostly impacted um, with Hurricane Maria. And we have a whole lot of installed fossil fuel capacity, much more than our energy demand. We also have um, power purchase agreements with private um, energy providers, which we'll talk about a little bit um, further along and very little renewables at this point. Very little, you can see the numbers, it's two to 3%. Um, and if you look at the, the, the amount of installed capacity over 6,000 altogether megawatts, we our peak demand is, is not much over 2,500 right now. So we have more than double of installed capacity. Now, as you all know, Puerto Rico is um, under, in, in a situation where there are multiple crises happening simultaneously. Um, bef even before the hurricane, we had the economic financial crisis with um, the uh, bankruptcy, basically bankruptcy of both the central government, public corporations like PREPA, et cetera. Um, we have, of course, the climate crisis. Uh, we had earthquakes after the hurricanes and, of course, now the, the, the COVID-19 situation. And with all of these crises, and actually as part of what exacerbated or brought about these crises is um, the development, the economic development model that Puerto Rico embraced in the 40s and 50s called, you may recall, um, um, Operation Bootstrap, which was based largely on huge tax exemptions and other invest and other incentives for private to, to attract private investment to Puerto Rico. And, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that the government is bankrupt. Um, the numbers, most recent numbers right now indicate that the tax in, in, uh, exemptions that the government of Puerto Rico provides for these industries to come in, mostly from the US, but also a lot from Canada and Europe, um, amounts to 20, more than $20 billion per year. That's twice Puerto Rico's budget. So not surprised that we're in a bankruptcy situation. The, we have um, 
huge and high poverty uh, rates, as you can see, 46%, um, high unemployment, um, me the median household income is one third that of the US, yet we have the second highest electric rates of any US jurisdiction, second or third, sometimes Alaska has higher. Um, and you know about the debt and the mass migration that's going on um, and that accelerated or almost doubled after Hurricane Maria. Um, and in the Guayama region, which I'll go to now, this, this environmental justice communities um, are even more um, impacted by, by poverty. And so this is a common slogan in Puerto Rico, the bankruptcy-like statute bankruptcy plus emergency management statute called PROMESA that was passed in 2016 um, is pushing austerity measures on people and that led to the um, vulnerabilities um, after uh, and during the hurricane. So this is basically an energy graphs of the energy mix, pie charts of the energy mix. You can see we have um, a lot of oil and gas and coal and very little renewables and the projection for what the government was proposing, which was this new methane gas infrastructure um, was not um, going to alleviate the situation. Um, we are seeing a rush of LNG industry, the methane gas industry wanting to bring and starting to bring liquefied natural gas to Puerto Rico, to other areas in the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico, et cetera, um, because of the, as you know, the gas boom of fracked gas in the US, there's huge pressure to bring it here. Now there's the legal quirk about not being able to bring it directly, but they're getting around this and making huge inroads. And that is totally contrary to the direction we are planning to go in as the civil society groups. We also have a situation um, of uh, classic environmental injustice that um, Ilda Jorenz and I have traced back to um, the uh, sort of what we call the, the coal death route. So we have a coal burning power plant here in Puerto Rico that buys its coal from Colombia, South America, right? Um, it used to be Cerrejón, but now it's um, more in El Cesar, um, which is a huge open pit mining operations in, in La Guajira, Cesar, um, and has created terrible environmental injustices um, with the, Afro, the YU um, indigenous peoples and Afro-descendant communities in those areas. And you can see from this next photo what it looks like to um, uh, have these huge um, coal extraction operations near communities. Um, it, total devastation of water courses, 14 um, tributaries to the Rio Rancheria have been deviated and, and, and damaged. And people, of course, are not. Um, uh, not in not not willing to live in this situation where they basically are have water rationing and, and no running water in many cases while the mine has uh, water in excess and has contaminated their water sources so we wanted to start with this extractive process and trace that um, back to Puerto Rico where we have the AES uh, coal burning power plant here in southeastern Puerto Rico in Guayama that is creating all kinds of um, externalities that have to do with air, water, uh, both um, uh, seawater and uh, freshwater contamination and usage that also creates rationing here in southeastern Puerto Rico. And then the what we call the visible externality, the coal ash waste, that what's left over after burning the coal and the heavy metals, and all of that is being just it, well had been for many years um, used as fill material at, at construction sites and totally contaminating um, the south coast aquifer here and this is what their at mountain of coal ash waste looks like here so we've had um, the collaboration from the university of puerto rico graduate school of public health that has done two 
um, epidemiological studies and finding that the communities closest to this coal plant, uh, coal burning power plant are four to five, six times um, more prone to uh, uh, respiratory cancer, uh, heart diseases, all kinds of things related to this contamination from the coal ash waste and the emissions. So it's become uh, it, it, this, this supposed use, the reuse and recycling of the coal ash as fill material at construction sites was this totally sham situation. And then to go full circle in terms of determine, um, saying what happens with the coal ash waste and um, looking at, say, a periphery jurisdiction to Puerto Rico, this coal ash waste was taken to the Dominican Republic and created havoc there. The ultimately AES settled lawsuits for claims of birth defects and other damages to the population there. And so also uh, talking about um, another jurisdiction here in the Caribbean that's trying to move away from this dependence and this energy coloniality situation is um, the US Virgin Islands that has set and, and is achieving and, and, and having more success in achieving renewable energy goals. And um, I, the, this is of course um, a dramatic photograph of Puerto Rico uh, right after Hurricane Maria on, on the top there. It was before the, the hurricanes and how basically we were sort of the most illuminated point in the Caribbean. And that's, that's something that's not necessarily to be replicated, but here is after the hurricane and how the power basically was just out in most places. And the, this is, was a symbolic protest of the people who died um, as a result, mostly of not having power. And so we're, at a crossroads here. Should we not only continue to invest in fossil fuels, but also should we have this centralized transmission and distribution system that is so vulnerable that comes from southern Puerto Rico and impacts environmental justice communities and um, is in service of basically the, the demand centers in the San Juan metro area? And of course, our answer is no, we do not want to rebuild the same system. We want to have those female HUD and federal government funds used to implement and create a totally different system um, based on community solar with our public utility. And we have a little plug here for documentary that we're working on, on the environmental injustices of, uh, that's uh, a result of Fossil, the fossil fuel system, uh, centralized system that we have in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Ruth, thank you so much for that brilliant and harrowing presentation. And, um, and thank you for saying, you know, we are at a crossroads and we don't have to continue this way. Um, let me now throw it to Sabrina Fernandez, who's written a brilliant article for the same math issue, um, thinking big picture about transformations all across the Americas. Um, Sabrina. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone and ACLA for making this possible. I was um, like, uh, I was just thinking many things from what Ruth was saying right now, right? And one thing that was speaking to me is how whenever we're dealing with matters of transition, uh, it is more useful, it, it is easier sometimes to create resilience when you decentralize a few things. So you can actually take care of the vulnerabilities. If things are too centralized, uh, if that one point is targeted, that creates a huge vulnerability and those that are going to pay the cost of it are those that are already very vulnerable, right? And this um, informs some of the, the conversations that I've been having around thinking about decarbonization in Latin America. So a lot of my work right now is focused on how authoritarianism is actually taking us backwards in terms of the protection of nature. Uh, and it's making it harder for us to um, you no, know, make, make to, to to make things possible by 2030. So speaking from Brazil, like the situation in Brazil is actually uh, quite dis disheartening right now. I'm currently uh, currently out, out of the country dealing with my research. But for example, um, yesterday um, it was the worst day in terms of the pandemic in a year in Brazil. So over 1,900 people dead from COVID. Uh, these numbers have been like going up steadily every day. Uh, we are now uh, close to 260,000 people dead in Brazil and 
no end in sight. Uh, Bolsonaro actually told people that they should just stop complaining so much. And so th this is the situation. We're far behind on vaccines. We're far behind in terms of uh, income support. And we actually, one of the um, oddest things about this is that last year, Congress managed to pass legislation for uh, just emergency basic income uh, and that actually got reduced later on. And for those that were eligible and received emergency basic income, but throughout the year of 2020, were able to perhaps get hired because they were unemployed or found a second job and their income went up just a little bit. Now they are required to pay back the emergency income and in one installment. So we have some really terrible things happening right now. And um, it is it is important for us to understand that ever since the pandemic began, uh, began, we have had a lot of people talking about how how do we get out of this because the economy is hurting, and they created this whole um, dichotomy, uh, you know, the economy meaning jobs or uh, profit, um, most uh, most out of everything. But talking to people, they would say it's jobs, but when it's actually about profit or lockdowns and um, our social distancing and actual healthcare, right? And in these conversations, they're all really worried about this economic crisis that comes with the pandemic. And uh, I, I thought it was important from early on to try to emphasize that there's no way that we can actually take on a path that they're proposing that if we're going through an economic crisis right now, the answer is just to keep doing things that the way that we, that we were doing them before. Uh, because we do know that uh, the pandemic and uh, sanitation crisis and things like that are also connected to the way the capitalism works and how it works in the most vulnerable places. Uh, we have the work of Mike Davis and Rob Wallace, for example. That's very important work for us to understand how pandemics and, and how these vulnerabilities are part of capitalism. So I've been trying to reflect upon that. But one of the things that make, makes things harder is dealing with authoritarianism and how can we actually present a new perspective, a perspective of transition, a perspective that's towards decarbonizing the economy and decarbonizing our way of life. So like going beyond uh, these uh, bigger structural matters, but even the way that we think about production in everyday life, uh, when people are actually dealing with the most basic of situations so like not being not like being safe not having what to eat and all of these other matters like right now we have people in brazil being arrested for tweets against bolsonaro so things are getting quite bad in terms of authoritarianism and i think this presents a real challenge for us talking about climate change talking about sovereignty uh talking about decarbonizing uh, when we're dealing with uh, countries that are actually going backwards because of their governments being far right, being uh, sometimes uh, openly fascist, and I would uh, put the Bolsonaro government, uh, you know, in, in this situation that some there are people who would say uh, that it's not a fascist government, but it's showing more and more of its face nowadays. And one of the things that uh, I've been trying to understand is that there's no way that we can detach this wave of authoritarianism, this wave of the election of this far right government from the robbery of nature. It is part of the purpose. It is part of the reason why they were elected. So even when we talk about um, the government, like the Trump government, the way that Trump got elected, how uh, climate denial was a huge part of his, uh, his narrative, how it was really important to get out of the Paris Accord and all of those things, and how we see this reflecting in other authoritarian governments throughout the world. And uh, speaking in terms of Latin America, we would see, for example, that when we look at Chile and we look at Pineda uh, with his uh, neoliberal approach to things, the robbery of nature is also implied because we were talking about like private services and like the matter of water for Chileans is quite important right there. And uh, it's no wonder that when we considered that when uh, those huge, amazing protests were happening in Chile, and Chile was supposed to, to hold the COP, and they transferred the COP to Ma uh, Madrid because of that, and Pineda was just pretending like nothing, nothing was actually like 
that bad in that sense and that Chile could actually had actually any any uh, good reputation to be able to host such an event. So when we look at Brazil, we would see a similar situation, but with a government that's far more conservative and but um, uh, would benefit, like let's say if Brazil still had a constitution that the way that Chile uh, still had before uh, this amazing vote and turnout with the Chilean people that, that was directly connected to the dictatorship, Bolsonaro could be doing much worse things right now. And believe me, he's trying to, um, to make these things possible for him. So one of the things that we have to consider right here is that as soon as Bolsonaro got elected, he started dismantling the environmental protection uh, a system that was in place at the federal government. So that's, that means taking away funding for fighting forest fires. That means taking away funding for climate change. Uh, so uh, we know that right away, Bolsonaro cut off 95% of the budget towards fighting climate change at the federal level. So we know that he appointed people to uh, certain places that just were just like plain anti-environment. So Ricardo Salles, the currently Minister of the Environment in Brazil, is part of the situation. Uh, in the beginning of the day, he was saying that I'm so worried about that and they're all paying attention to COVID. Wow, that's, that's the moment for us to just you know, walk all over it. And the, the way that he said it, like make the cattle go through, uh, talking about agribusiness here. So in Latin America, whenever we're talking about the far right, we need to be talking about the elites and uh, the capitalist interests. There are in place that help to make these people um, as powerful as they are. So we need to talk about agribusiness. We need to talk about private mining interests and we need to talk about oil. And uh, this has led me to bring out a conversation that sometimes I ask a question that people think would like it's quite odd, right? So uh, let's say like, should eco-socialists support national oil companies? When you look at it right away, it might, it might be kind of strange, right? We're, we're talking about decarbonization. We are talking about uh, getting out of the fossil fuel rut. We're talking about bringing in renewables. We're talking about energy sovereignty. And we know that we cannot have energy sovereignty uh, related to oil. And we cannot have a proper radical change that's going to make like lead us into socialism without uh, these conditions. So why should we be supporting national oil companies? So part of the conversation is that in countries that are plagued by a system that uh, in, in a Marxist dependency theory is usually referred to as cap like dependent capitalism. So, and we know that Latin America is part of this dynamic, a dynamic where our countries don't have proper economic sovereignty, that we're very dependent on dollars and exports and these fluctuations in the financial market. Um, we're dependent on commodities, especially. Um, this means that um, when, when, whenever we're dealing with oil and other resources, fossil fuels, but also other mineral resources, it means that there are a lot of private interests, foreign private interests coming at it, trying to influence the government, uh, trying to place their bids, uh, trying to, for example, in the case of mining companies, uh, trying to mine within indigenous territories and within protected areas. And we know uh, what, like the impact of this in many places. I, I um, so like in um, Professor Kling Klinger's article there, like she mentioned like the situation in Venezuela and Brazil and these pressures uh, for mining in protected areas and the kind of impact that has, right? So why, why would we then support these oil companies if we're actually trying to get away from fossil fuels? And one thing that, that actually try, strikes me as really important in this situation is that we have a lot of workers that tend to be organized in labor unions, there are in these national oil companies. So like, let's say like we talk about Pemex or we talk about Petrobras in Brazil, and these workers could actually be the key for us to change these companies in towards renewables. So rather than talking about, well, forget a Petrobras because it's about oil and we want renewables. So forget about them. Uh, let's just think about how we could actually perhaps change Petrobras into solar brass or something like that. 
and the workers are key here. And the reason why is that these companies are basically operating towards private foreign interests at the moment. And we, in the case of Brazil, we have a lot of um, like different like oil, um, oil interests. They are being privatized, right? they're being sold out. And because of uh, the fact that we have stocks involved in this as well, we do know that foreign interests are actually more important to this current government than national sovereignty. So it's not even about oil for Brazilian people so we can produce, so we are not as dependent. It's about how can these other companies profit the most. So this is part of the situation. And because of this, we do know that a lot of labor unions, they talk about, well, Pet Petrobras is for Brazilians. And sometimes they talk about the oil is for Brazilians. And sometimes they would say, for example, in the case of the pre-salt layer in Brazil, um, the, the pre-salt is ours. And that means not privatizing, that, that means not selling out. But this could also mean that these labor unions are actually going through a reverse process of saying, well, since it's ours, it's about sovereignty, let's just use it all. And this is one of the challenges. So uh, we would see, for example, conversations around the labor unions, around Petrobras talking about using oil, um, using the pre-salt, because the pre-salt would give us 100 years of and this is quite a complicated situation because 100 years, so like where are we going to be at the end of this century if things keep going the way they are going? Like why are we even in problem? So this is where we enter into or decarbonization. So when they hear about decarbonization, they don't think, well, I'm going to lose my job and this is going to be terrible. Or that other uh, people in the left may think that, well, you're talking about decarbonizing and you don't care about Petrobras, so what? You want Petrobras to just you know, be in, in foreign hands? So this takes us back to a conversation that's quite important uh, whenever we're talking about Latin America. We need to talk about anti-imperialism and how there's no way we can uh, talk about an eco-socialism in Latin America or a project such as a Green New Deal in Latin America without an anti-imperialist stance. And this require us, requires us to perhaps be in a situation where it might look odd to other people that we are eco-socialists supporting national oil companies for a while supporting national oil companies with conditions, supporting these companies so they can actually be in the hands of workers and so they can actually be controlled by a popular power so they cannot be controlled by capital so they can go through transition. Because we do know that if these companies are completely privatized, the tendency is that all of this oil is going to be uh, exploited anyway. This is, uh, this is also always going to happen. We know that's the interest and they're going to be, the oil is going to be ex explored and all of the riches are gonna go abroad and we're just going to lose out anyway. So the plan is to um, try to integrate this conversation of the transition a lot more and to make people understand that it's quite urgent. A few years ago, back during um, the PT government in Brazil, so pre-coup, Petrobras was starting to have conversations about renewables and even had interest into uh, solar and, and wind power. And by the end of the process, and that has a lot to do with some of the neoliberal uh, stances coming out of Dilma's second term pre-coup, um, Petrobras was starting to lose interest again. This focal, focus on the pre-salt started being like the, the main part of the work there. And now with Bolsonaro, well, whatever was left of this is being auctioned off. So we're talking about like uh, all of these investment that was like public money investment through Petrobras into wind, for example, and then the Bolsonaro government just selling it out basically for change money. And this is part of the problem right now because we were starting to get a little bit of consciousness out of this. So like the biggest uh, leftist labor union in Brazil, the CUT, was even talking about climate transition and climate jobs. And then once we have the coup, the conversation starts going backwards because we are just reacting. 
we are reacting because now they're privatizing more. Now the workers are going through even more uh, difficult situations. So like during the Bolsonaro government, they had had to go on strike and this affects workers' consciousness. So part, part of our job right now is to make sure that whenever we're talking about energy sovereignty, and we know that this is a particularly a strong focus whenever we're talking about decarbonizing, because we cannot, uh, we cannot think of energy sovereignty only as the end point. Uh, we want to decarbonize, so we will have sovereignty through renewables. No, we kind of have to start working on sovereignty right now so we can reach renewables, because we're talking about countries uh, that are underdeveloped in many ways. We're talking about countries that perhaps don't have access to sanitation in parts, parts of the country. It is one of the reasons, for example, that whenever we're discussing degrowth in Brazil, uh, the word degrowth rings really badly with people. Uh, and so uh, the, the way that we need to talk about is about transition, transition, the, these tactical changes from one area to another area. And uh, something that ha tends to work is whenever we talk about workers in very strategic industries being key to make the change. So work, working with them, working with these labor unions and trying uh, uh, most of all to strengthen these labor unions as well, because we also like part of the, the challenge that we have is that unionizing in Brazil, for example, uh, has been going down but it's still quite strong in some of these strategic places related to, to uh, for example, mining, to oil, and related to some, some uh, parts of, for example, steel working, things like that. We still have strong labor unions there, uh, but uh, the, the discourse is still very much based on, well, let's use all of these resources for Brazilians and now let's use these resources in a process of transition so we can change our own situation and we can perhaps even adapt the jobs. So this require, requires us to think about what kind of training we can offer these workers towards transition and what kind of training we should be offering at the universities. We need to start talking very, very eagerly about uh, curriculum, what's being offered. When you look into the engineering and uh, engineering towards energy in Brazil, where we're seeing mostly oil and gas, oil and gas is very, is very rare. And like you would have to have people specializing for them to uh, see it from another standpoint. So you have these people, they're graduating and they're being shaped towards oil and gas. So what's going to happen? They're going to defend oil and gas. It's going to be quite hard to bring them on board because it's their livelihoods at stake. So um, this work with labor unions and talking about job creation, it is key here. And is this, uh, this, is quite, uh, this is quite important because uh, for a long time, the conversations around environmental protection in Latin America um, uh, tend to be at odds with some of the labor unions because they do think it's about doing away with their jobs. So like if you're, you're talking about even, for example, in Minas Gerais, where we had two huge uh, mining accidents. So in uh, um, scare quotes here, because we do know, for example, just in one of them, uh, we have evidence that uh, Vali uh, was involved in some really suspicious drilling that we could call criminal right away, but like equal side actions nonetheless. And um, the, even so, even with these terrible disasters, like people being killed and ecocide all over, the communities uh, uh, in part don't want the companies to leave because it means their jobs, it means their livelihoods. So one of the main processes is to take the companies that were privatized and get them back into the public scenario. So we need to talk about nationalization for certain. And for these companies, they are considered national, but are not, are not completely national because they either being traded publicly or you have some sort of like mixed capital involved, we need to get them 100% national. And one of the ways to do this is to make sure that this is uh, directly inserted into the demands whenever these workers are going to strike. And this is directly inserted into the conversation about ener energy sovereignty today, not only tomorrow, but starting right away. 
And that, that's part of why whenever we're envisioning a conversation about eco-socialism in Latin America, it is a conversation about creating conditions. It is a conversation that's so powerful that I, I actually do think that out of all of these conversations about socialism, eco-socialism as a stance is the most powerful one when it's about creating conditions for change, because we do understand that it's not just about, well, let's talk about class consciousness and change the correlation uh, over here. It's also about making sure that we have a planet where we can build socialism upon. And decarbonizing right here is key because uh, right now we can talk about decarbonizing out of the crisis, but not of the way of these like capitalist versions uh, even when like eco-capitalists want to talk about Green New Deal or something like that. They say that decarbonization is a way uh, of coming out of this, this economic crisis as well, but in terms of getting back into capitalist economic growth and even the way they talk about green jobs is different. But for us, it should be about when, when our green jobs need to be sovereign jobs. So if our green jobs are sovereign jobs, and it's not about getting back into capitalist economic growth, it is about changing gears and changing gears and creating conditions for further radical change. And I do believe that we can have an eco-socialist type of Green New Deal in Latin America, that means that we're going to have uh, more workers involved. This is going to help help with class consciousness consciousness, more communities are going to be benefited and they're going to see how, how this actually has a lot more potential. This is going to help with organizing and this could probably lead us into further radical change towards actually getting out of capitalism. And that's basically a part of the conversation right now. And um, well, I look forward into like more, more of the discussion and, and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I feel like I'm already getting a tan from Solar Brass. Um, it's such a beautiful idea. And it's, uh, it's sort of like it's radiant and it's already coming all up in the chat and the queue and everything. So thank you so much. So excited now to turn to Julie, who's been writing about mineral extraction and energy in Latin America all around the world, uh, in fact, and really thrilled and excited to hear what she's got to say. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel and Pia, Heather, Nicole, and Nestor uh, for organizing this. And thank you so much to Ruth and Sabrina for sharing uh, your knowledge and experience. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we're gathering, of course, during an ongoing pandemic um, amidst all different kinds of, of personal and, and larger hardships. And so at a time when we could all be doing anything else, I am really encouraged by the fact that we're all here together tonight. So let's take on the material dimensions of decarbonization. Like let's really get nitty gritty. Let's talk about the actual raw materials that are needed to decarbonize. I think you probably already know the argument. So we're gonna take it on in the next 15 minutes or so and see where we end up, all right? So the argument is this, widespread imp implementation of renewable energy technology is going to require more raw materials. Yes, we know this. Um, there's plenty of arguments advanced with uh, the best of intentions, but also plenty also advanced in, in bad faith. They're saying, well, you know, this is just going to cancel out uh, any gains that we might make from decarbonizing our economy. But here's the thing. Renewable energy technologies comprise only a small portion of the global technology metals demand. And I project that this will remain true even with a renewable energy transition. So information, communication, transportation, and military technologies account for a much greater share, according to one study done by the European Commission, among others. So leveraging an energy transition to clean up the technology metals supply chain would generate benefits across multiple sectors and therefore serve a whole range of strategies and interests. And this I would say is the promise and the peril of my mineral supply chain focus. So as I'll outline though, we don't need to start from scratch, but we do need to fundamentally tra transform our status quo. So I'll just share some slides to guide our thinking on this at a very fundamental level before we start getting into uh, some of the nitty gritty details. Okay, so here, ladies and gentlemen, is our current status quo. We dig a big hole and we build a trash mountain. This is unimpressive. This is a scorched earth approach to resource acquisition. 
right? And it's not just digging holes, but it's also erasing the landscapes and lives in these places um, and imposing multiple forms of risk and waste and danger on communities all along the supply chain from the mine to the dump. But here's the thing, any change in, in extractive practices has an environmental footprint. This might be obvious, but it bears saying that not all environmental footprints are equal, and we must be careful as we revision um, the Green New Deal that we do not fall into the grooves of environmental injustice that have defined relations and imperial relations in our hemisphere. So very simply, how do we understand and evaluate change in relation to this fundamentally unimpressive status quo? Uh, simply, uh, we can ask, is it a regressive change in that it perpetuates or retrenches the status quo, which of course is characterized by the concentration of benefits and the simultaneous intensification and extensification of harms? Is it regressive or is it progressive, right? In that it transforms the status quo to reduce the intensity and extent of social and environmental harms, ultimately getting them towards zero in a radical democratic sense, disrupting and redressing their historical tendencies. All right, now here's the complicating thing. We must ask where, for whom, and in what manner. And when we're speaking hemispherically, we have to take into account these questions of scale. All right, so here's a very simple scalar diagram um, on how to, and how to understand and evaluate change in relation to geographical scale and scope. So we might ask ourselves, uh, how, do we, how do the effects of any of our proposals differ across the scale from the personal to the global? It is possible, of course, for an action to have both progressive and regressive elements. And these can and often do differ across scales. So now let's keep all of this in mind as we think through the following. So mounting electronic waste and chronic fears over the scarcity of technology metals whether it's rare earth elements or niobium or tantalum or lithium, these are two sides of the same coin. So even as technology metals periodically feature as geopolitical flashpoints as they often do um, with respect to my other primary research site with this, which is China, um, the thing is we currently throw away more than we produce each year, right? This is according to estimates based on uh, US geological survey data and UN figures. So these dual crises of mounting waste and scarcity fears, these can actually be addressed in a very concrete way. Uh, and one crazy idea that I wanna put out here for all of us to think about, that can actually be addressed by co-locating mining and recycling uh, facilities in order to literally build a circular economy, literally close the loop, right? What would this do? This would stem the flow of e-waste to vulnerable communities while ensuring that the energy, renewable energy infrastructure that's necessary for a Green New Deal, whether it's wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, high-speed rails, batteries, grids large and small, and the requisite information technology to come along with this, this will make sure that we won't run in, into any raw materials bottlenecks, which is one major concern. Now, the good news, I think, is that across the Americas, we have the technological, infrastructural, and institutional know-how to make this happen. So for example, there are two technology metal mining facilities, one in, one in the Southwestern United States and the other in Southeastern Brazil, that they are equipped currently with the highest possible international environmental, environmental management certifications that currently exist. Of course, we can and must push the envelope further. But with relatively minor modifications supported by sound public investment, these sites could be outfitted to usher in a new, this new sustainable paradigm of literally closing the loop. All right, so this approach would actually help us ensure that the benefits of this paradigm shift are shared across North and South America. Of course, there's regional and local variations, scalar differences that we have to take into account. And I would posit that while this might be expensive, redirected fossil fuel subsidies could be one possible source to fund the recycling redesign. Now, the thing that we have to keep in mind here is that if the United States implements the Green New Deal with no regard for the origins of essential raw materials, then the increased demand for technology metals will most likely accelerate the devastation that we are seeing in indigenous and frontline communities on new extractive frontiers throughout the Americas and across the world. So implementing the Green New Deal according to the prevailing mining and e-waste disposal practices would achieve an energy transition 
only at the expense of landscapes domestically in the US and overseas. So there's a violent and destructive way to do this that serves the authoritarian interests resurgent in many of our countries. And I think many of us are acutely aware of this. So this dynamic though, it could offset any social or uh, gains in greenhouse gas re uh, emissions reductions and would also deepen existing inequalities across the hemisphere. Here's the other thing we have to confront, but I think this is also an opportunity. So implementing the Green New Deal will, will generate large volumes of e-waste um, by updating uh, vehicle fleets, by retrofitting energy and efficient buildings and decommissioning obsolete technologies in order to replace them with renewable and efficient uh, infrastructures. Now, the most common practice for managing e-waste has basically amounted it to making it someone else's problem according to the regional and global geographies of imperialism and environmental injustice, right? It's often foisted on villages in Southern China or in urban peripheries in Ghana or elsewhere. And we cannot let this play out on a hemispheric scale, which would simply retrench the inequalities between parts of North America and all the rest of the Americas. So in order to fix this, we do need to develop a plan to ensure that waste is handled responsibly. This does not mean building bigger, better dumps, but rather getting rid of dumps entirely. We can do so much better than uh, digging big holes and building trash mountains. And in fact, e-waste holds the mineral wealth that's essential to build the next generation of technologies. So the question is probably, how do we do this? Um, now, I would posit that building a circular economy for technology metal supply chains, this is an example of what we might call radical incrementalism, right, that can take us from our present predicament into a brighter future. Um, each step of this, of course, being a site for democratic struggle and uh, possible contestation. So while this alone is not going to solve our climate crisis, it can address the dual concerns of e-waste management and technology metal supply chain scarcity. If we have, for example, a widespread adoption of, of recycling programs, we can tap into the single largest frontier for these critical elements, right? Such as waste, which would stop the violent expansion of mining activities while curbing e-waste, which has of course wreaked havoc on a generation of vulnerable communities across the globe. Now, a hemispheric approach to the rapid and widespread deployment of renewable energy technologies would catalyze a much needed cleanup in the entire technology metals life cycle. So how do we do this? Like to build on what we have, we should literally close the loop in the circular economy. We do this by co-locating recycling facilities on existing mining sites, right? This would solve the problem posed by the fact that almost nobody wants a mine or an e-waste recycling plant in their backyard and with good reason. So established and environmentally compliant mining operations that have a robust record of working with local, state, and federal regulators would help ensure that their operations do not pose additional hazards to nearby communities. And these I would propose are likely the best places to start. Although I acknowledge that none of this is utopian, we are being nitty gritty here. So I mentioned there are two existing sites, one in North America, one in South America, that could potentially provide test cases to launch, launch the initiative. Both sites could be destinations for minimally processed e-waste, and both could continue to be producers and global exporters of technology metals until such time that ideally, that is only necessary at a minimal level. And what this would do is it would re-regionalize and de-peripheralize global flows of raw materials and e-waste. And this would draw the mining and waste frontiers together to diminish the environmental footprint of both. So I can get into the details of this in the Q&A, but to wrap up, I just want to address three of the most common concerns and very reasonable ones that people tend to have with this idea. So these pertain to energy, economics, and cost. So the first is the energy question, right? Won't this be super energy intensive? And I would say the short answer is yes. Right? Industrial scale e-waste recycling is energy intensive, but we need to keep this in perspective. Right, The emissions and waste byproducts it generates are no comparison to our business and usual, as usual scenario. And also under our, our approach, renewable sources powered on site by harnessing the heat and energy generated by e-waste processing could eventually 
be used to meet additional energy demands. There are plenty of successful models of uh, where factories power their own operations through clean on-site waste incineration. These could be adapted to e-waste recycling facilities. The second question has to do with the economics of this. I mean, how do we actually um, shift this status quo in the near term, uh, given that anything that's recycled is probably much more expensive than the stuff that's currently be, being produced. And so, yes, um, on the economic front, any raw material that is produced through such a process would likely be much more expensive than those that are more cheaply available. And I would say this is really not a new problem. Unless mandated and incentivized otherwise, firms have tended to seek the lowest price inputs regardless of the social and environmental cost associated with mining. So here's an opportunity then at a national level, specific and appropriate subsidies could help create market certainty while we are still in our market context, even as a projected increase in supply through recycling brings prices down. And while we're talking about prices, the third question is of course the cost. How do we build this to scale on a hemispheric level? Isn't that going to cost an awful lot of money? And here again, the short answer is yes, followed up with a, but so what, right? On the question of cost, the answer is really straightforward, right? Misallocated subsidies currently netted by the fossil fuel industry could be redirected to fund the necessary research, collaboration, collection, permitting, and recycling programs across the Americas. So just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, the fossil fuel industry captured 85% of all government energy subsidies worldwide. This is a figure from 2015, according to a 2019 International Monetary Fund report. And that same year, 2019, the US federal government handed fossil fuel companies 649 billion, which exceeds the entire military and defense budget by 50 billion. Right, this in the country that spends more on military and defense than much of the rest of the world combined. So I'll end with this. There's more than enough money to build a functionally renewable technology metal supply chain as part of the Green New Deal in our hemisphere. And as part of a hemispheric transition away from our fundamentally destructive status quo, illustrated by our current practices of digging holes and building trash mountains. And here's the thing, business as usual presents really our worst case scenario. I would say that we have nothing to lose, everything to, everything to gain, and probably a lot of mistakes to make along the way. But the obstacle is neither really actually fundamentally cost or even technology. And I think that we should be encouraged by this, that what remains to be tackled is the question of logistics and policy. So I would invite a discussion around this, around the radical incrementalism, around the forms of social organization at multiple scales, from the personal to the hemispheric to the global that can take us there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, I'm gonna be opening the video of the um, other panelists or inviting them to show their video as we enter the radically democratic phase of horizontal discussion and it's the panelists in this webinar, um, Zoom democracy. Um, Tia, do you wanna kick us off with the Q and A? Yeah, those, I'm just like, like vibrating from how amazing those presentations were. Um, so much to think about. Um, and I'm gonna start us off with a question that, I, that occurred to me in reading your pieces originally, but that is only like more salient with the ways that you've actually presented it today. Uh, so this is a question for all of you. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about the relationship between a more democratic and just energy system on the one hand and geographic scale on the other hand. And this came up in different ways in all of your presentations uh, and, and in rather nuanced ways in all your presentations. So Ruth spoke initially quite a bit about community ownership, so kind of local uh, understanding of energy democracy and, and the way in which the technology of renewable energy facilitates this through distributed generation. Um, but then she kind of complicated that by tracing transnational fossil fuel supply chains, right? So kind of ways in which energy systems are interconnected, even if the uh, desire might be to localize them. So I'm curious, you know, Ruth can speak to that um, um, however she'd like. And then uh, in Sabrina's presentation, solar brass and both national and kind of regional ideas about sovereignty were were forefronted and thinking about how 
worker ownership of nationally owned strategic companies like Petrobras might be important in very important in the energy transition to build a base of, of working class support. So we have this national scale, though, also at the beginning of Sabrina's presentation, she spoke a bit about the importance of local energy systems for, for resiliency. So we got sort of two different scales there. And then in, um, in, in Julie's um, presentation, we went back to these sort of transnational supply chains, though then a proposition for sort of co-locating waste and, uh, and recycling and mining. So kind of back to a local scale anyway all of the scales, but I'm curious what, what you think the scale of eco-socialism is in the Americas? So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to clarify that um, we're, we're totally cognizant of the fact that calling for massive rooftop solar batteries requires a whole lot of extraction in maybe lithium in Chile or uh, in different um, parts of Latin America and, and throughout the world. Um, and that that is something we need to avoid to the extent possible. Um, that, that's why we um, also talk a lot about the other components of, of the transformation, the radical transformation that have to do with um, it's something, a term that's not used that much anymore, but energy conservation, or now it's called demand response and uh, efficiency and all of these other things. But um, basically, uh, we need to incorporate, and, and I know some people commented on the energy literacy, which has a big, big role to play, and how um, and it's hard in, in a jurisdiction like Puerto Rico and Brazil and other places where, um, yeah, we're not um, as, as, say, developed or prosperous or whatever, uh, uh, that people are still thinking about the possibilities of a growth in a way that uh, exacerbates extract extractivism. Um, but but we're we're thinking that um, while the scale is local and, and there are lots of local benefits, we must keep in mind the um, jurisdictions that are impacted by by even this transformation. I'll just unmute really quickly to say all the scales. All the scales are the right scale to work at. Um, everything that that uh, we've talked about tonight, and then the other articles in the collection besides, you know, uh, are these accounts of people working simultaneously at and across multiple scales. Uh, let's keep it up. <laughs> um, Michelle Levy has an old article about democratic planning under eco socialism. Uh, that's actually like about a different context or like he's making like a, a critique of overly centralized planning um, in real socialism. So that's why he developed that. But I actually think it has a lot to offer in the sense that when we're talking about scales, we're also talking like, um, like, like, like Julie said, in, in a sense that um, it can be many at the same time. You can be doing things at the same time, right? So for example, when we're talking about energy, um, if we're talking about like supporting a national company, because you, we do need to understand that we need to support a grid and we need to make sure that all regions of a country like Brazil, Brazil is huge, right? So uh, we need to make sure that all regions of the, uh, the country are part of the grid. Right now, in 2021, we have one state in Brazil that's not part of the en uh, energy grid, Paraima. Roraima is not part of the grid. Roraima used to actually import energy from Venezuela, from like a hydro plant in Venezuela. And as things got worse uh, between Bolsonaro and Maduro, no wonder. And also in terms of the, the, the blockade against, against Venezuela and the uh, hydro plant itself in Venezuela going through um, challenges in terms of like having the parts to, you know, to make the upkeep and things like that. Venezuela stopped uh, selling this energy to Horaima. So Horaima right now is actually like burning um, um, fossil fuels and it's uh, it's about 3 million reais a day. 
to keep up the energy of this one state. So uh, under capitalism, we do not have a proper uh, energy grid in the country. And we do need to have like something a, li a little bit more at the national level to make sure that we have a system that integrates all of the regions and we, we would not have like a, a poor region like the North region in Brazil completely neglected, even though a lot of the power the powers, the other, uh, the other like uh, big areas, financial areas of the country is actually going from these regions, and it's going um, from like it's coming from there. Also, because they went over indigenous territory, um, they destroyed the Amazon for it. So uh, all of the contradictions are part of it. So we do not, we do need this kind of like national scale right here, so we can have a grid. But we need to make sure that this grid is accountable. So that requires, for example, to make sure that we, we can talk about energy uh, without, without talking about uh, settling uh, land, like indigenous land. We need to make sure that indigenous land is actually um, like properly given back. And like we need to talk about reparations in that sense and we need to make sure that the territories are respected. And so that leads us back into the, the ground level here talking about a little bit more small scale. But this is small scale is connected to national legislation in a way or another. So we're talking here like pre-socialism, right? So uh, there's legislation involved. So um, whenever we're dealing with this matter of scale, we need to make sure that people are talking and we can have them like represented at different levels because we can have this grid and this grid is going to be there as a backup plan, but at the same time, uh, a lot of incentives to make sure that you have more autonomy and then people can have solar in their houses instead of these hu huge uh, solar plants outside of the cities. They are much less efficient. Uh, that uh, a lot of the um, eco-capitalists, they prefer that because it can just like have this huge infrastructure and they can sell it rather than people producing their own energy. So how amazing would it be if we actually uh, make sure that uh, people have a lot more of their energy supplied by themselves at the domestic level and the grid is there to make sure that you're dealing with uh, um, with like uh, interruption, like so, for example, uh, when we don't have uh, when we, the sun is not shining, and we we're dealing with also like the industrial processes, we're dealing with hospitals, schools, commercial centers, and we are, we are going to have like this huge level of articulation in that way. So right now, our main point is to make sure that you can emphasize autonomy and we have to have a lot of investment in that because uh, right now, when people talk about it, when we talk about having like solar in your house in Brazil, people are like, yeah, so you're rich, right? It's like, wow, like the, is this something that we see in big mansions? Uh, it's not very common. Uh, we're dealing with a place that a lot of people don't actually have like um, water reservoirs in their houses. So if there's rationing and the water is cut, the water is cut directly, they don't have anything left. So if they don't have water reservoirs, imagine having solar in their homes. So investment needs to go towards autonomy. But right now, a lot of this investment is going to these huge green companies to produce uh, uh, subsidized solar panels that are selling to upper middle class families. They're not, there is not being provided. So you need to have like, um, the, the way they're talking about like the, the, the local and the national here is that like, for example, you could have a national plan to make sure that the local is provided for giving autonomy to these people. And at the same time, having large scale investment into infrastructure to make sure that everyone is on the grid, which is one of the main challenges right now. We had Amapá, which is also in the north of the country, was without power for a whole month in November during the pandemic. So like babies were dying, dying in NICUs and it was a huge disaster, but the upper, uh, upper class neighborhoods were not without power because they had solar at home. Serena, the way you, you ended there, it's, it's right on this argument a lot of us have been making and, and undoubtedly as well, that this is about eco-apartheid, that without universalistic systems, then the resources of resiliency will be hoarded by the wealthy and largely the white. Um, and I also want to note, of course, we didn't talk today, but Texas, which should be in Latin America, is also experienced this problem of grid isolation. And so from, you know, Puerto Rico all the way on down, we're seeing analogous developments nested inside imperialism and colonialism, but also very profound analogies where in the U.S. rich households are buying solar and batteries precisely to not depend on the grid. Um, so I want to ask 
a question of mine and then two questions from that have come from the Q&A. And I'll just invite you each to sort of pick what you want to answer. Um, so two of the questions from the Q&A. Um, one is, we environmentalists in the Caribbean and Latin America face the jobs versus environment argument on crack, so, particularly in poorer, smaller, less developed economies. How would you confront these? So the jobs versus environment, how do we take that on in, in Latin America, um, in the Caribbean? Um, Another question, what are some ways of educating the public about green energy, especially in areas where there are low resources, low income areas, and presumably where the conversation about, about green energy um, is not already happening? So how can we provide education and then not the neoliberal variety? And then a question from, from me, which you can, you know, again, just choose what you want to answer is, who's, who's going to do this? Like, who are the core coalition members who are going to make this happen? Um, that's, I think, the long-term question is who is the protagonist of left-wing environmental politics from below? Um, so any thoughts you have on especially important actors or especially important coalitions that are driving the eco-socialist agenda, that would be most um, welcome. So um, Julie, you were so gracious by saying all of the scales um, as all of our heads were exploding. Maybe I'll turn to you and give you first crack here at a, at a nice full answer. Um... Yeah, I think that I definitely appreciate the uh, the question about, you know, the, the jobs versus the environment trade off. And I think that actually resonates really nicely with a question that was also put into the general chat, right, which was, you know, an observation that none of us actually specifically addressed the question of reparations for climate change. And I think that this is that this is right on and the questions are actually related, right, because um, uh, people are are being forced, right, uh, beaten with this terrible choice between jobs that destroy the environment or an environment on which to live, right? That should direct our attention toward, you know, the, the historical forces that imposed precisely that uh, incredibly narrow way of living and being in the world. And I think reparations, a reparations framework is maybe a way to get at undoing that, right? So the reparations framework, I think, is something that also needs necessarily to be uh, hemispheric and multiscalar um, because there are these different intersecting uh, matrices of, of inequality and injustice that aren't neatly divided by race, class, gender, or a national identity lines. I could go on, but I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Ruth, um, please. Can I jump in about um, the, uh, how to convince the public about the green energy. I, I don't think they need convincing, certainly not here. Um, and what Sabrina just said at the end about wealthier people uh, are getting these systems on their rooftops and they have the resiliency, they have the backup systems. In fact, they may even use them as primary systems. Um, so that I think is very clear to people that these, these green technologies, right? Coupled with a lot of other things and, and, and not just as techno fixes, but, but as lifestyle changes um, are the way to go. Um, and so I don't, I don't think they need much convincing. It's, it's the financing, right? It's the upfront financing that, that's the problem. And that's why we're talking about a Green New Deal because we're talking about a large investment that pushes us over this uh, climate crisis. Uh -huh. um, so in terms of the poor, uh, the so-called so jobs versus um, environment conflict, I think, again, what we're seeing more and more is that um, people are seeing this more as a life versus uh, jobs, right? So it's not just the environment, right? So we know for, we've known for a while that communities, um, especially environmental justice communities um, and countries, whole countries um, have to make this choice, um, but that it can be in a way that saves lives and creates jobs. I mean, it, everyone knows that, that um, the transformation, wholesale transformation of the electric system will generate lots of jobs. And as um, uh, Klinger, I'm sorry, first name, 
Uh, Julie, sorry, this is my teaching Zoom as well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The the money is there. It's just being handed over as as subsidies for fossil fuel companies. Um, I talk a lot lot about jobs in in my presentation, but I'd like to actually take another jab at it, talking about uh, jobs for youth uh, who are currently desperate because there are no jobs and um, uh, sometimes like when we look into analysis coming from the US, the whole thing about how young people are very much indebted and the American dream is dead and things like that. And in Latin America, there was never anything such as a Latin American dream. Uh, we were just like making ends meet and trying to make it happen. But even so, um, the like the generation, like before mine, I'm 32 nowadays. Right? Yeah, like I, I think, of, yeah, I'm 32. And uh, <laughs> my mind is like uh, blowing up from information lately. And um, let's say like people who are like maybe like 50, 60, they got a chance of like perhaps a stable government job in Brazil you know, if they manage to get to university. So we're talking here about like a, a white middle class that actually got a chance at something. Um, uh, black communities, no chance at all in Brazil. Indigenous communities going through extermination still, right? So this perspective of having stability, um, uh, part of the population in Brazil got to access it, but still a very like small minority. And that's, that's why a lot of people in Brazil think that the middle class is actually an elite. <laughs> and when the middle class is really, really far, far away from, from the actual elite in Brazil, right? And then, uh, but the situation right now is, is even worse because we went through a lot of educational reforms that actually presented an opportunity to you thinking that, wow, now I may access university. So perhaps affirmative action uh, as part of this. So like indigenous uh, youth and black youth being able to access the university, being the first ones in their families and they're getting their their degrees and they have no jobs, absolutely no jobs because neoliberalism has taken over. Uh, Informal jobs are on the rise. So people don't know like, well, I have a degree but now I'm delivering food through iFood or Rappi or whatever company it is at the time. So the, the situation is actually quite hard. And if we can actually present these jobs as a way to integrate youth and get rid of youth unemployment, this is also a shot that we have at this and showing that, well, oh, you got a degree. Like I'm talking about people who even got a degree in law, <laughs> law degrees, and they don't have jobs right now. A lot of PhDs out of jobs. And, um, and you think of people who did not go to university, but they could perhaps get basic training and go towards the trades and maintenance and things like that. So a program that considers uh, like youth jobs, youth green jobs is also quite important. So not just talking about like transitioning jobs that are already uh, looking to the energy industry, but also new jobs. Uh, jobs focus perhaps or even of environmental education. I think that could be quite powerful. We do know that uh, some traditional communities throughout uh, throughout the, the, the whole continent, actually, they have managed to create jobs through very responsible, non-capitalist ecotourism and like showing the roots. There are communities close to where I live in Brazil um, that actually like provide ecotourism that shows, well, this is where our communities were murdered by, by uh, our, the colonizers. And um, this is where they were trying to mine and we were standing up there like for so many days during like under sun and under rain to make sure that they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do this and doing like no political education through tourism as well. So there are a lot of opportunities there for jobs that connect with some of this. And I think this is um, this is part of the situation of like educating the public, because if you have these youth in these jobs, you're getting the word out there as well. They even educating their parents that might not be as, as aware of the situation, because we do know um, this, the, the whole thing about climate change is that, well, it's like greater Thunberg again, the young kids and fighters for future, and they're all excited about this, but a lot of the parents and grandparents are thinking, wow, well, what are these young kids talking about? And we, we, this is part of the reason why, for example, climate denial is, uh, is strong in um, older demographic. 
uh, than the youth because it does seem like something really new and like uh, you know out of their touch and out of their comfort zone. So getting the youth into these jobs is a way of educating as well. And I do think that if we're going to be talking about you know the uh, I don't want to say million dollar question, what are we going to call it? Like the question that Daniel asked <laughs> about who's going to do this. Um, looking at Latin America, we do know that there is no way that we're going to have this level of transition without having indigenous and traditional communities at the forefront. It's absolutely impossible. If anyone's proposing something in that sense, that doesn't have these voices at the front of the conversation is a colonial project and we should have nothing to do with it. Um, uh, we are going to have collaboration of people coming from all backgrounds, of course, but we need to make sure that we understand those that have sac sacrificed the most and they're still sacrificing and they have had nature's best interests at heart from the beginning. So they, they need to be leading this and they're actually being murdered right now. Um, the, the rates of like murder of like um, uh, environmental activists in our continent are very much connected to people who are racialized, to women, to indigenous peoples. So they're, they're facing huge threats right now. So they need to be leading up this, this whole project. And of course, we need to have like a, a lot more young people involved because even as I said, you know, small small matters because I do think this is quite easy like something that Julie keeps saying this is actually quite simple to do you know they're not doing it, but it's actually quite simple so another thing that's actually quite simple to do is to change the curriculum <laughs> so we could have like student movements actually engaged into changing the curriculum as part of their fight against neoliberalism because I think this is quite connected if you're fighting against the neoliberalization of universities and if you're fighting against uh, uh, you know the capitalist interest in universities trying to get like public, universal, free education uh, for everyone, we need to, you need to talk about what's being taught there as well. What kind of jobs are going to come out of there? So like we, we need to have students and youth in general more engaged into this. But in any, uh, what's going to draw the big line between, um, you know, the capitalist version of a Green New Deal because they co-opt everything, so that's what they're doing. And an actual, uh, you know, like eco-socialist Green New Deal is how grassroots it is. You know, if we're actually keeping uh, those who have been oppressed and explored at the forefront, if their voices are being heard, because they're the ones they're able to bring into the tone of the conversation and make sure that it's radical enough. They're the ones that make the content different. It's not just that, well, it's different content when it's capitalist and the other is anti-capitalist, but why? Why is the other anti-capitalist? Because it is being built by those who are oppressed by capitalism. Um, thanks so much. Um, uh, amazing answers to those complex questions, everybody. And we have a few more questions. So what I think I'm gonna do, just noting the time, um, and I'm I'm just so thrilled that folks have have stayed with us for, throughout this event, um, and and I know that we just have a little bit more time together. So I have what I've done is kind of selected one question for each of you, like just curated them from the chat, and then hopefully there'll be a moment for some closing thoughts um, uh, uh, before uh, the end of the event. So um, I'll I'll say them kind of each in in order. So one is um, for Ruth. Uh, and, and I'll just read it. This is from the from the audience. Um, after Hurricane Maria, we were told over and over again that FEMA was not permitted to upgrade infrastructure, but was limited to repairing pre-existing inadequate infrastructure. What is it that blocks FEMA or other agencies from upgrading infrastructure? So that's the question for Ruth. Um, the question for Julie, actually from Ruth, which I thought was a quite good question that I also want to know the answer to, is, um, might it be better to keep discarded metals local, local, I assume, to the site of their consumption, um, local and prohibit shipping them out like the Basel Convention uh, recommends rather than co-locating them with, um, with extraction sites? And then um, for Sabrina, uh, what, what about the question of commodity food production? Soy, beef, et cetera, are major Brazilian exports. How can we push back against the argument that a Green New Deal, which would mean reining in deforestation, 
uh, would destroy Brazil's balance of trade by making industrial farming more difficult. So one question for each of those and try if you can to keep your answers to a minute or two. Um, so hopefully we'll have time for some closing remarks as well. All right, so the, the FEMA funding issue, um, we've been through this, uh, yeah, since Hurricane Maria and it's a myth. It's what the gas and the fossil fuel industry and the um, transmission distribution companies are saying, in fact, they said it this week at a hearing that FEMA funds cannot be used to transform, to um, build something that provides the same service, right? Not the same infrastructure. Um, that is false. There's something called the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. And uh, really just, uh, it, it was a myth. It, it, it's it's, just, it's in, in, in industry ploy to, to take all this funding that it would be provided by FEMA and use it to rebuild the same thing versus empower a, a radical transformation of the system. Thank you, uh, Julie. Uh, yeah, so this, this question um, that Ruth posed and, and uh, I think is a, a, on a lot of folks' minds too. I mean, I'm also cogitating over this because it is, it is actually a scalar question. And ultimately, if we want to um, address the sort of irrational forms of globalization that intensify exploitation and emissions, then we do need to shift toward local uh, reuse, redesign, repair, and all of this. And so this this answer probably uh, won't surprise anyone, but you know, it's uh, I, I don't I don't actually think of it as an either or uh, between the local and the regional. I think it's it's definitely uh, we need all of the above and whatever we can do in relation to um, in relation to mineral supply chains is. The right thing to do even if it's really humble and kind of frustrating with how humble it is um, because that's kind of where we're starting. I mean um, I'll just say very briefly that the, that the big thing that I've been puzzling over with this is like okay so there's this yet another you know uh, mining related rush that's driven by speculation around the renewable energy um, uh, transition and it looks an awful lot like mining related rushes that we've seen before. It, horrendous, violent, and frankly, not very innovative. It's a tired old script. And so my thinking was rather, okay, how can we make this, how can we take the wind out of the sails? How can we obviate it? How can we take the steam completely out of this, out of this enterprise? And that's where the sort of the co-locating, literally closing the loop um, in the, um, energy, energy minerals or technology minerals supply chain might actually help obviate that if for no other reason that it keeps the current large scale operators busy. Right, so that's not that's like a long term goal. But just thinking kind of strategically, how do we diffuse the rush. That's an idea that came to mind. Wow. Coming like a, a country that's very much reliant on agribusiness and the like, um, and like the, the entire financial system in Brazil is completely tied up with agribusiness nowadays, right? So when we talk about agribusiness, we can't think of just like large scale farming. We need to talk about all the corporations involved, uh, the traders that they can be throughout the world. And like most, like most recently, I don't know if you heard of this, um, people are trying to sell. Um, pieces of land within indigenous territory on Facebook marketplace. So this is how bad things are getting. So the, the indigenous communities in Brazil, the, the, they've been putting a lot of effort into, into trying to make sure that these ads get removed from Facebook. But nowadays, like we, we can't talk about uh, agribusiness without talking the financialization of the process. And now how you have like investment funds that are like, uh, you have a lot of different investments into one package. And this tiny little thing makes you own like zero point something something percent of uh, agribusiness, like a huge farm in Brazil. This is how bad it is. So this is definitely part of the challenge. We cannot talk about a Green New Deal in Latin America was also talking about agrarian reform where it was not done. And like Brazil is like basically the, the uh, poster child for you know not having agrarian reform. 
uh, it is really, really bad. And this is why agribusiness puts a lot of effort into uh, placing ads everywhere on TV, online, talking about how agribusiness is pop and tech and amazing and that Brazil cannot live without it, even though we know that the majority of food that people eat actually come from small scale farming. How do we deal with this? Uh, one of the situations that I think might help is to uh, strengthen patterns of food sovereignty in the country. This means dealing with uh, the social movements. They are fi fighting for agrarian reform. They're producing food, trying to make sure that we get this food uh, into the cities and also try to work within uh, how can you promote food sovereignty from inside the cities. So we're talking here about like community gardens. We're talking about having uh, these open air markets that it's that instead of people going to the supermarket, people getting food directly from the from the local farmers, getting back into this culture as much as possible. This is going to help to make sure that you have an economy flowing and we don't have as many uh, small, small scale farmers right now who are actually, um, you know, go hungry. So they're producing food and they go hungry because they, know they cannot get their produce out there because the supermarkets, they make these deals with these huge, uh, huge, huge farms. And then the, 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 the small farmers, they cannot get the produce out there. And this is part of the challenge right now. If this, if this is actually fixed, so we, we help with the supply chain of the small farmers, we're actually like helping economically as well in terms of production. Something else that would, would make a huge difference here is what, what happens with subsidies and tax breaks and uh, loans. Uh, the majority of these investments, they're going towards huge agribusiness nowadays. So when we're talking about fighting this, it's not just like, okay, let's get rid of agri agribusiness. Let's defund agribusiness. I think this is like a very, again, very easy thing to do. <laughs> it, can, it can be done like with a pen in the hand of the right person, which we don't have right now. Right now we have the absolutely wrong person there. But like with a small pen, you can actually defund agribusiness and fund small farmers. When you do this, you're creating another level of the, of the economy flow that's a lot more solidaristic, that is local, that's promoting food sovereignty. And it means that it's going to um, have this huge change within how the financial market works. And this is the main challenge because we're talking about commodities here. And if the country is still depending on commodities to, uh, to have some sort of like um, um, better balance sheet, which we don't have right now anyway, <laughs> uh, this means that we're still stuck with independent capitalism. So what do we do? We, we integrate these things. At the same time that we defund agribusiness and we're funding uh, small scale farming, we're funding peasant movements and things like that, we're investing into an energy grid, uh, where uh, energy grid, we're making sure that um, uh, new jobs are creating in other areas, and you reorganize the system. Obviously, this might this might mean that we're going to have huge G GDP shocks uh, here and there. But isn't that part of the point? It, uh, I think look, we need to start uh, focusing on the fact that yes. Uh, to make these things happen, we're going to have like some financial market crashes. Some banks are going to go crazy, but I don't care about the banks. We just need to make sure that we can secure people, people's deposits. So it is a different system. So we nationalize the banks. No problem then, we nationalize the banks. So every time we create a problem, and this is about making radical change. Making radical change is about fixing some problems and creating other ones in the process. And every time you create a problem, we just go further, further, further into more radical change. So uh, if this happens, if like the financial market is crashing and a lot of banks are going bankrupt, you just nationalize them. Why not? And if we nationalize them, then good. Now we can make more loans, more loans to these small farmers. Oh, now we can make loans for people to retrofit their houses and things like that. So. Um, if people say that if we get rid of agribusiness, Brazil is going to go broke, uh, for me, it's just actually, well, this kind of Brazil should actually go broke. And like, what are we going to have to do to fix it? Instead of going back into like the, the capitalist blueprint, we actually go further into more radical change. And I think this is going to be a lot better if we had 
uh, the other countries in Latin America joining together with this because I, our continent is really, really powerful. And uh, a lot of economies in other places in the world, they depend on us um, as much as we depend on them, but their capitalism is not called dependent capitalism because they're the ones reaping the most benefits. And this is what we need to change here. Thank you. Um, and I love this vision of radical change each time bequeathing even more radical change. Um, I just want to offer Ruth or um, Julie, if you want to say anything, just like one minute to kind of also wrap up on a kind of general um, level, Ruth. Yeah, um, well, this is very specific, but um, just want to do a shout out and, and, and get people to, um, if at all possible, uh, create some pressure on the Biden administration, FEMA and HUD uh, to earmark the funds that they've allocated to Puerto Rico for the Puerto Rico electric system for the transformation for on-site community-based solar through the public utility rather than rebuilding. And that's, that's just the message. And to the extent that people can write or call or contact us, we'd be happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Julie. Yeah, I will, I'll amplify that. That's a concrete action that we can do. And you've just seen a really compelling it's a compelling case for that tonight. Okay, well, look, um, yeah, Sabrina, any last words? Yes, but uh, I just wanted to say something here because um, I, I was just looking to the chat. I, I tend to do this a lot when, <laughs> when I'm presenting. Uh, I think it helps us to uh, keep us um, very sharp. And this is one of the things right now, I, I think in a lot of places, we're all very desperate right now. We're extremely, um, you know, out of hope, basically. I, I feel hopeless every day. And this is not a very good feeling to have when you're trying to promote radical change, like a revolutionary change. <laughs> um, it actually makes it hard to convince people if we're feeling hopeless. And this has, this has been one of, my, uh, one of my main challenges. So I think like for last words, I would just say like, let's keep the exchange. Like if we keep exchanging our debates, ideas, experiences about this, uh, every time we're feeling like really, really badly about what's going on, we can remember that, well, in that one place, that one thing worked. And over there, that one thing worked. So like we're gonna keep a little bit, a little bit of the spark alive. And I think this is what a lot of us need right now to keep going because it hasn't been easy, but it's not going to be easy anyway, right? Thank you. It's not going to be easy. Um, this has been such a rich night of exchange and dialogue. Uh, the questions are like overflowing. The chat is overflowing. My brain is like the multi-scalar head exploding emoji where each fragment of the exploding head is yet another emoji whose head is exploding. So it's just like, um, but this is great. So this is the first of three major events looking back at the 50th anniversary of NACLA please do go to NACLA.org and check them out. I think we need these institutions that promote internationalist exchange of ideas, that promote internationalist uh, dialogue and organizing and convening. Um, huge, huge, huge thanks to um, Thea for helping to organize this, for Nikki at NACLA, to everybody at NACLA, and then most especially to our brilliant panelists, uh, Ruth, Sabrina, and Julie. Um, Mind-blowing night. Let's keep this conversation going. Keep these exchanges going. And uh, you know, we have only the one choice to win in this decade. And it feels, despite everything that was said, it feels easier after tonight to imagine a path forward. So thank you all very much, and hope to see you all very soon. Thank you all. <laughs>